Your Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, able represented by the Vice President, Senator Kashim Shetima GCON, Honorable Ministers, Commandant Secretaries, Directors of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, Captains of Industry, Members of the Advisory Board of the NESG, esteemed leaders from the academia, respected heads of ministries, departments, and agencies of government, members of the Joint Planning Committee and the Central Organizing Committee, members of the press, members of the NESG community, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to welcome you to the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit, jointly organized by the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning. This summit represents a significant milestone in our quest to build a resilient, inclusive, and prosperous economy. I thank our founding fathers who conceived the Nigerian Economic Summit three decades ago in response to economic challenges similar to those we continue to face. High inflation, limited growth, and unsustainable debt weighed heavily upon our nation then, just as they do now. Nigeria has experienced two recessions in the past decade, each exposing deep-rooted structural vulnerabilities that must be addressed with renewed urgency. Hence, today's challenges demand a new approach centered on collaboration to promote growth, competitiveness, and stability. While our nation has made significant strides, our challenges are also very clear. The twin problems of income inequality and multidimensional poverty continue to cast a long shadow over our progress. Nigeria struggle with an uneven distribution of resources, microeconomic instability, and institutional fragility that prevents us from reaching our full potential. The task before us, therefore, is to forge decisive reforms that can break these cycles of stagnation and pave the way for equitable growth. Since our recovery from the 2016 economic recession, the Nigerian economy has shown resilience, but still remains fragile. In 2023, Real GDP growth slowed to 2.74%, down from the 3.1% that was recorded in 2022. Those are lighting the difficulty of sustaining momentum among persistent structural challenges. These challenges include security concerns, human capital deficiencies, and inadequate infrastructure. And they've created a complex environment that stifles business and limits economic growth. The policy reforms of 2023, particularly concerning the first subsidy and exchange rate liberalization, were needed critical steps. These reforms end praise internationally. They improve our credit outlook, and they also have helped to attract foreign direct investment. Yet, these reforms also underscored our vulnerabilities, exposing structural weaknesses that must be tackled to achieve lasting economic stability. The positive impact on our current account, government revenues, and FDI inflows is quite notable. But we must take additional steps to ensure these gains are not reversed. The Nigeria economy displayed resilience during the first half of 2024, with GDP growth reaching 3.1%. This growth led by gains in both the oil and the non-oil sectors, marks a modest improvement and is slightly higher than our population growth rate. However, the recorded growth was uneven, benefiting a small range of industries while failing to generate sufficient jobs. To ensure sustained growth, we must also focus on inclusivity ensuring that economic progress lifts all sectors 
and all communities in our country. Your Excellencies, government must prioritize institutional reforms, especially the reduction of the cost of governance, for instance, by implementing the Orosanye reports, and also accelerating the privatization and commercialization of many underperforming national assets to attract the needed capital, but also the private expertise. And of course, to optimize their usage for the commonwealth of the usage of our commonwealth for the benefit of all Nigerians. Government must implement its electoral promises by aligning policy, programs, performance, and productivity to ensure we seize the opportunities of today and take full advantage of the prospects of tomorrow. Encouragingly, our SNI economic position has also improved. The removal of fuel subsidies and the liberalization of the exchange rates contributed to a trade surplus of above 12.1 trillion naira in the first half of 2024, which is double the surplus recorded in 2023. Government revenues have surged with FARC allocation reaching 18 trillion, an increase of 82% over the previous year. And foreign investment inflows have also increased, boosting our foreign reserves. Yet, these gains are tempered by microeconomic instability. The Naira has depreciated by over 72% against the dollar, and inflation remains high at 32.2%, placing immense pressures on individuals business and on the economy. Our fiscal situation remains a significant concern. Public debt reached 121.67 trillion by the first quarter of 2024, pushing our debt to GDP ratio to 52.9%. The debt service to revenue ratio is still high at 68%, even though that has reduced but those underscoring the urgent need for fiscal reforms to put our nation back on a sustainable path of development. Our citizens ultimately bear the cost of economic fragility. Our capital income is projected to fall to approximately $1,000 by the end of the year, down significantly from over 2000 in 2022. Multidimensional poverty now affects 2.9% of Nigerians, while an estimated 104 million of us live in poverty. The Global Hunger Index score of 28.3 points reflects our deepening food insecurity and the unemployment situation that remains a daunting challenge, with more than 92% of the workforce being in the informal sector. Many citizens have become poor the poor are getting poorer, and the average Nigeria is facing very difficult times. We need to do more, do better, and do it faster to provide social safety nets, reduce inflation, create jobs, improve food security, improve transportation logistics to address the cost of living crisis. We also must foster social cohesion and a strong sense of solidarity and unity amongst our citizens. The outcomes of last, last year's summit focus on igniting growth, ensuring, ensuring sustainable investments, and also reviving national dignity. We have seen positive development in many of the actions taken by the government, such as the establishment of the Presidential Economic Coordination Council and the Economic Management Emergency Tax Force. The recent approval by the Federal Executive Council of the Economic Stabilization Bills from the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms is a testament to the government's commitment to enhancing fiscal sustainability and economic governance. The NESG has set up a live policy tracker to monitor the implementation of past summit recommendations and to ensure alignment between the summit recommendations and the national outcomes. Despite notable progress in achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 5 that focuses on gender equality, significant barriers still persist. Intersectional challenges 
including cultural norms, limited access to reproductive health services, and economic inequalities continue to hinder gender parity. Accelerated economic growth will require the moderation of the growth of the growth rate of our population, but will also require deliberate inclusion of women as active participants in the economy across all the states of the Federation. Advancing gender and socioeconomic inclusion requires deliberate actions, such as strengthening legal protections, enhancing data collection, and adopting gender responsive budgeting to create a more inclusive society. Significant strides have been made by the federal government in reforming our business environment, in attracting investments, also to enhance enhancing productivity. Recent gains by the military against terrorists and bandits, bandits in the north are providing the much needed relief to small and large businesses alike. While legislative and regulatory reforms are positioned us on the path for global competitiveness. However, Persistent challenges, such as the multiplicity of taxes, regulatory unpredictability, inefficiencies and bureaucratic red tape continue to impede growth. Addressing these challenges are quickly too, is essential to create a thriving, a thriving private sector and to improve the quality of life for all Nigerians. Rebuilding trust is an urgent imperative and will require sacrifices by all and sundry, including all of us in this hall, and especially our political leaders to foster a sense of we are in this together. Businesses must give attention to nation building as they do to managing their balance sheets. Citizens in their own private lives must also put the nation's interests ahead of individual and sometimes selfish personal interests. As Michael Potter reminds us in his seminar book, The Competitive Advantage of Nations, in a modern global economy, prosperity is a nation's choice. Quote, nations choose prosperity if they organize their policies, laws, and institutions based on productivity. Nations choose prosperity if they upgrade the skills and capabilities of all their citizens and invest in the infrastructure that allow commerce to be efficient. Nations choose prosperity or limit their wealth if they allow their politics or policies to erode the productivity of businesses. They limit their wealth if skills and opportunities are reserved only for a few. Nations limit their wealth when business success is secured by family connections or government concession rather than productivity, end of quote. So we all must choose prosperity and act in a way to provide opportunities for all. We must seize the opportunities before us to rebuild the foundation of inclusive growth. The fiscal space created by the reforms of 2023 offers a unique chance for us to invest in our natural capital, our infrastructure, our human, and also our social capital. We must harness our resources, energy, agriculture, and solid minerals, and build infrastructure that will enable productivity. Above all, we must invest in our people, ensuring every Nigerian has access to education, health, nutrition, and economic opportunities. Now is the time for the strategic legislative and regulatory reforms to secure a prosperous future for us. We must create frameworks that enhance productivity, unlock key sectors of the economy, optimize underperforming assets, and strengthen our markets to foster trade and investment. Our natural resources have shaped our past but I'm convinced that it's our productive human resources and a talented youthful demography that will define our future. Why the private sector 
will be the engine of growth in that future. Hence, government at all levels, be the executive, legislative, and judiciary, across all our MDAs and all our regulators, must all work together to fuel that engine of that engine of growth and not to frustrate it. Money moves at the speed of light. Hence, governance too must be fast, predictable, and transparent. A stable and inclusive economic environment is desirable and is essential. At this critical juncture, I call on all of us, government, private sector, development sector, and the civil society to join hands in building a shared prosperous future. By investing wisely in our collective future, we can build a more competitive, resilient, and prosperous Nigeria for generations to come. Today's challenges demand a new approach that is centered on collaboration to promote growth, competitiveness, and stability. Sir Albert Einstein noted, you cannot solve problems at the level of thinking that created them in the first place. Hence, I believe this admonition has great implications for us in Nigeria today, as a rad radical paradigm shift is required in our individual and collective mindsets. And our philosophy must change to one that supports and propels economic transformation. The reemergence of a dominant, globally competitive, and prosperous Nigeria is predicated on systemic changes in our values, in our leadership, and consensus on what matters most, and commitment, great commitment to the rule of law, economic development, social stability, and democratic accountability. Together, we have the power to build an economy that not only withstands shocks, but that also creates lasting prosperity for all Nigerians. The road ahead may be complex, but our potential is far more significant. And with shared vision and determination, we will persevere, we will innovate, and we will overcome. Once again, I welcome you all to the next 30. Let's dive into the discussions. Let's connect with fellow participants. Let's get inspired by the diverse perspectives that will be shared. Get ready to be part of shaping the future of Nigeria. Together, we can create a prosperous Nigeria where no one is left behind. And as said in our national anthem, O God of all creation, grant this our own request. Help us to build a nation where no man is oppressed. And so with peace and plenty, Nigeria may be blessed. May God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much for that warm. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome remarks. Once again, please let's celebrate a chairman Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Mr. Nii Yusuf. So he's welcomed us in basically English, and we've been doing English since morning. But this summit has um, the Francophone in our midst and other people in our midst. So we'd like to also um, relate with them. And then we we'll have people reaching out to us online. Uh, bonjour, Madame Emosio Distangue, invité. Bienvenue au programme d'aujourd'hui. C'est la 30e édition du Sommet économique nigérien sur le thème Action collaborative pour la croissance, la compétitivité et la stabilité. Nous sommes ici pour trois jours. Uh, je crois que vous allez trouver la conférence très intéressante et profitable. Nous sommes à Abuja et ici à Abuja, il n'y a pas de problème. Il faut rester avec nous et calmez-vous. Merci beaucoup et que vous, Dieu vous bénisse. Uh, guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren, und herzlich willkommen hier. Uh, Ich wünsche Ihnen eine wunderbare, spannende und unvergessliche Erfahrung. Uh, for those of us in, who are joining us outside Nigeria, in Nigeria we do three major languages, which you will appreciate. Here in the northern part of Nigeria, Abuja precisely, we speak house majorly. Do you have a chance to speak to you in the country? Do you have a chance to speak to you in the country? 
munanan yau gobe da jibi ku kasance tare da mu ba ku da matsala a fanfani a wali da yuba kin be ka ba sai aperu yi to se pata ani gbagbo pe ajo ma gbadu aperu yi ojo meta bakula fun ma se aperu yi e dara ko peluwa a ojo gbadun e makandi gojure ba o dromaya nandi gojure ba e bo blani mi ho ma ayin ga hurin di gune ba e am ku rawe zo ku kwaashi kaina ganu suru ni suru makana uga gan ko ma uga potu apotu wanu ne akadu fo excellencies very distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen kindly join me as i invite on stage to give the clean remarks for this august and auspicious occasion his excellency atiku bagudu cun Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Please give him an outstanding, resounding, resonating, reverberating round of applause as he comes to give the opening remarks for this very auspicious occasion. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. President, President Asua Yubola Ahmed Tinubu heavily represented by the Vice President, Senator Kashu, Mustafa Shatima, GCON, members of the National Assembly, Honorable Ministers, Permanent Secretaries, Chief Executive Officers, the Chief Executive Officer of the NESG and members of the NESG Board, as well as the organizing uh, committees that work so hard to deliver this. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Let me join Ni Yusu. It's always confusing why he's reading the opening address. I'm doing the opening remark to underscore that, that because it was done to underscore the fact that this is a partnership between government and the uh, Nigerian economy, uh, economic society team which came to be known as NESG. And Your Excellency, Mr. President, just before you arrived, there was an interesting panel in which the history of the NESG was reviewed by a very competent panel of those who have been there at the very beginning, including Dotun Suleiman and as well as many others. And the Excellency, it's my pleasure to welcome you at this 30th summit organized by the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Your Excellency, Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me start by, on behalf of all of us, extending our sincere appreciation to His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Nibuji CFR for his continued support and commitment to the summit process. It is important to recall that Mr. President personally participated in the 29th summit, and today is being represented by His Excellency, the Vice President. This is the clearest testament and reaffirmation of the high regard this administration accords to the economic dialogue. Your Excellency, Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this summit has over the years played a pivotal role in the sustenance of our national dialogue on the economy and frame our deliberations within the context of the aspirations for a better quality life for our people. It discusses our vision of equity and social justice the enviable economic and political order we are committed to creating and forms the basis for forging consensus by promoting and sustaining cooperation between the public and private sector. I'm sure if someone was listening to Ni Yusuf's opening address, he would have been made by a public officer because it speaks to the collaboration in terms of we don't have time to waste we should narrow our, we should celebrate our achievement and focus on those things we can do better. 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the summit has remained one of the biggest platforms for dialogue among top policymakers and corporate leaders. The three decades of this partnership between the federal government and the Nigerian Economic Summit had provided a veritable platform for interrogating public policy and preparing enduring solutions to the country's socioeconomic problems, particularly for a government that during the campaign interacted and make an undertaking to the National Economic Summit Group that it will sustain the partnership. Last year's summit theme was pathways to sustainable economic transformation and inclusion. The summit come, came at a critical juncture in the nation's social and economic trajectory as a new administration that took up in May 2023 was settling in office, having campaigned on a renewed hope agenda and strategy. It focused on crafting immediate and long-term strategies for fostering economic growth and development. The summit recommendation continued to inspire government to reform critical sectors of the economy. For instance, the 29th summit emphasized the urgent need to tighten foreign exchange rules, broaden official market and harmonize fiscal and monetary policies for a balanced approach to economic stability. It highlighted infrastructure development as pivotal to sustainable economic growth, recommending, recommending prioritizing power generation, road networks, and transportation system. Pass one to the renewed hope strategy and in line with this recommendation, President Aswaju Bola Mitinibu's administration has sustained its foreign exchange reforms, eliminating the hitherto multiple rates even as the Central Bank of Nigeria find, regularly fine tunes its guideline to enhance monetary stability. Because of the bold, painful tackling of the punitive subsidy regimes that is affecting both currency and energy, funding to the three tiers of government had improved in addition in, to enhancing the ability of governments to meet social investment and even minimum, minimum wage uh, payments. The president approved the renewed hub infrastructure fund earlier in the year. The fund is an innovative tool to generate financing, not from the budget, but utilizing equity component on the budget to promote, enhance, and create employment opportunities in transformational projects in rail, railway, coastal railway, the 700 kilometer, for example, 1,000 kilometer Sokoto Badagri, rail, uh, uh, Sokoto Badagri Superhighway, and as well as dams, irrigations, and investment in an energy transition led by CNG, which is designed to cheapen Nigeria's energy availability so that we remain competitive. Between last year's summit and today, we have had Nigeria's energy availability so that we remain competitive. 28.77, uh, 2024 annual budget and an amend, a 6.2 trillion naira amendment which incorporated the renewed hub infrastructure fund into the budget. The three budgets demonstrate our commitment to restoration of macroeconomic stability, funding our priorities such as security, agriculture, and food security, as well as innovation and the creative economy. Innovative measures include expansion of consumer credit to support manufacturing and access to affordable credits, mortgage reform to expand access to housing, student loans funding, CNG penetration as expansion program, as well as digitization of government services. All intended to, among others, expand the economy, reduce deficit, and attain an increase in capital spending. These measures are complemented by a host of trade and fiscal reforms, some of which Ni have spoken about. In addition, the decision to accept NERA payment for crude oil for domestic refiners and the oversubscription 
of the domestic dollar bond issued are both expressions of confidence in both our and growing confidence in our economy. Increased investment is being witnessed in infrastructure, energy, agriculture, and digital economy. Your Excellency, just a few days ago, the Ministry held a joint planning board meeting in Nasarawa and in, 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 a, in a confirmation that the subnational economies are, are taking up the opportunities, the governor informed us that two lithium processing plants are currently being uh, constructed in Jigawa. Sorry, in, in Nasalawa. Just last week, again, I was in, in Katsina State, where the governor told us, as a result of improvement in security, 95% of the areas where uh, planting did not take place last year, in 2023, this year, those areas have been planted. I think those are significant evidences that the reform and investments are, are working. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, including these governance and institutional reforms have helped improve our macroeconomic performance. Our GDP has been enhanced from 2.98% growth in first quarter of 2024 to 3.19 in quarter two of 2024. Inflation is trending downwards, while external reserves are improving. Our external trade balance improved slightly in the second quarter of 2024, all testaments to the efficacy of the reforms. Therefore, we seek cooperation and understanding of the broad spectrum of the citizenry as there is indeed light at the end of the tunnel. The economy is facing the right direction and the decline has been arrested. What we have achieved, what has been achieved is a result of boldness, resilience, and collaboration. And thus we need more to compensate for the decades of underinvestment and to ensure that we deliver a collaborative, competitive, and stable environment. We must not determine the winners, but ensure equity. The economic stabilization builds the uh, emergency economic team and the presidential economic uh, management team are all testaments to the desire of the administration to collaborate more. Your Excellency, the team of this year's summit, collaborative action for growth and competitiveness and stability reflects the critical imperatives required to sustain our economic growth and development and improve the lives of all. This is consistent with the government's commitment to the renewed hope agenda and the revised national development plan and to uh, continue the collaboration with the private sector. Your Excellency, I will conclude by again recall, recalling that before you came, Dr. Suleiman said something that 30 years ago, when the NESU was uh, established, it was a military era and the decision making was unitary. And that's that the, the import of his statement was that that time, if you are able to convince the national leadership, uh, then everything flows smoothly. Now we are in a constitutional federalism with three tiers of government and with a presidential team that are committed to federalism. So the tax is even more demanding in the sense that you have to convince different levels of government. So it is on this maybe background that we have to, and in fact, the, 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 the constitutional democracy increases the demand for government services because you have institutions, assemblies that they owe their existence to promoting and ensuring constituency demand. So it is in this background one can appreciate that turning the economy in the right direction, given the need to convince and carry along 
both subnationals, development partners, international institutions, and countries and rating agencies who are expressing confidence and putting on the work for the commendable action is all the more not worthy. We have interacted with many people, many institutions, and they, particularly our uh, development partners led by the World Bank, and they have been very supportive because they have seen the transparency with which the administration has approached partnership in terms of endearing confidence so that all of us. I believe by the time we meet in 2025, the positive trajectory uh, under the renewed of agenda will be cemented. Thank you for giving me today. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. Uh, can we give a resounding round of applause to the Honorable Minister of Budget and Economic Planning? Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Senator Atiku Bagudu, CON, thank you for your commitment to the growth of our economy here in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Your Excellency, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mojibade Shosoye. I'm a professional compare, a television presenter, and a very proud Nigerian. So it gives me great pleasure to serve as one of your compares this afternoon. Now, I'm particularly excited about the theme for this year's conference, which is collaborative action for growth, competitiveness, and stability. It not only highlights the urgent need for unified efforts to navigate an increasingly complex global economy, it just also reminds me of the words of the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde. She said, and I quote, Economic growth is never by mere chance. It is the result of forces working together. So on this special day, as we celebrate 30 years of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, I'd like to thank all of our partners, you public sector forces and the private sector forces who have worked together to ensure that we are here today. So please give yourselves a resounding round of applause. You are, and so we are. So thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you for your commitment. Now, talking about partnerships, our next speaker is one of our partners and representing an organization that has been a formidable partner and a long-standing partner of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group and, of course, Nigeria by extension. He will provide a political leadership and a governor's perspective, demonstrating how global financial architecture dynamics influence and, of course, shape economic development in African countries, particularly Nigeria. It is at this point that I'm truly honored to bring up on stage the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of the World Bank Group. Please give a resounding round of applause as we make welcome in Demet Jill. Please sustain the applause till he gets here. We're truly honored to have you here at the 30th Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Thank you for your continued support of the Nigerian economy. Thank you for your partnership and thank you for even the future. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so I am very, very pleased to be here. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first I want to thank very much the, uh, the, the I would like to thank the, the Vice President, Mr. Vice President. I would like to thank the Minister of Planning and Budget and the Minister of Finance. And I would like to thank the Chairman and the CEO of NESG for the invitation to my boss, Ajay Banga, who is the president of the World Bank, to participate in the discussions today. So Ajay regrets very sincerely that he could not be here, and he sends his regards to all of you. Uh, so I am a poor substitute for him, uh, but I'm very happy to attend in his place. So I'm happy because Nigeria is an important country at a very critical juncture, and I would rather be here today than anywhere else. So I was asked to talk about the most pressing challenges affecting Nigeria and Africa's economic development and growth. So I'm going to focus on Nigeria for a very simple reason, because Africa goes as Nigeria goes. So given its size and significance, and the success of Nigeria's reforms that are happening today will give a big boost to countries across the continent. 
And because the whole world has a stake in Africa's future, the whole world needs to pay attention to what Nigeria is trying to do today. And actually the whole world is paying attention. So as I speak though, there is a lot of suffering in all sections in uh, all parts of Nigerian society, but especially among the poor and the young. They want good schools, they want decent colleges, they want decent healthcare, good jobs, and safe conditions that allow them to use this potential to make full use of this potential. But high inflation is hurting everyone today. It is hurting them the most. So oil wealth that should be used for the welfare of all Nigerians has for too long been used to benefit just the elites. The elites are also being hurt by these reforms that started last year, but they have done very well in the past and they have built big buffers. The ordinary Nigerians are being hurt even more and they were hurt much more by the policies of the past and they don't have any buffers. So their welfare should be uppermost on our minds today. So you're probably thinking, tell us something we don't know. Have you come all the way from Washington to tell us this? Um, so I will talk, so, so I will talk today about things that you can probably see more clearly from far away than from close up. So I will instead remind you that the problems that are being tackled today in the Nigerian economy first surfaced more than 40 years ago when oil prices began collapsing in the early 1980s after the big oil boom of the 1970s. So I'll make a brief detour into history because I think it is important to do so. It is important because the wise say that those who ignore the lessons of history eventually relearn them, but in much more painful ways. So I want to start by saying there are three crucial aspects of oil. The first is that it is an exhaustible asset. Everybody knows that. The second, it is a fickle asset. Its prices are among the most volatile of all commodity prices. The third is that it's a national asset. And this means that like Nigeria's forests and seas and rivers, its benefits have to be shared across every segment of the society and across all generations. So over the last 40 years, oil has come to dominate the Nigerian economy. Nigeria's economic growth, its exchange rate, its stock market, all move with the oil price. But this was not always the case. It happened because of poor fiscal and exchange rate policies during the oil boom of the 1970s. Massive increases in oil prices brought massive increases in wealth. Yet Nigeria's fiscal deficit shot up to between 7 and 10% of GDP. What happened also was that current account, the, the deficits in the current account also ballooned along with external debt. In short, what happened was that Nigeria's fiscal policy became highly pro-cyclical. So the government's, so what ended up happening was that the government ended up amplifying oil price volatility instead of reducing it. Instead of insulating ordinary Nigerians from the vagaries of oil markets, the government made them even more vulnerable. This was the first mistake. Then oil prices started to fall. They started to fall in the early 1980s. This meant that the value of the Naira fell as well. But instead of letting the exchange rate adjust to the new reality, Nigeria decided to prop up the Naira. The government tightened foreign exchange controls and import licensing requirements. In doing so, it set the stage for a parallel exchange rate market to emerge creating a big gap between the official and the unofficial exchange rate. This meant that ordinary Nigerians would have to pay many more Naira to buy dollars than better connected people. This was the second mistake. These two mistakes led to two bad outcomes. The first was that businessmen began chasing import licensing 
at the official exchange rate because it guaranteed them a profit at the nation's expense. The second is that agricultural and manufacturing exports were decimated because the difference between the parallel and the official exchange rate essentially became a crippling tax on exports. So between 1970 and 1982, the production of Nigeria's major cash crops, which is cocoa, rubber, cotton, and groundnuts, fell between 30 and 65%. By the middle of the 1980s, cocoa was the only real agricultural export left. But its volume had actually shrunk by 50%. Nigeria's share in cocoa production fell by half to 8%. So Nigeria had in short order become both oil dependent and grossly distorted. It was now an undiversified economy with a rent seeking society. Nigerians soon realized that this, that this posed dangers to this great nation. So some of you are old enough to remember that Nigeria attempted a serious reform in 1987. My colleague Brian Pinto, who is here today, was a young economist at the time. He and the finance minister, by the way, joined the World Bank's prestigious Young Professionals Program at around the same time. I think they're both in Abuja today. But essentially, what this meant was that this involved reducing fiscal deficits and trying to return to a market-determined exchange rate via the second-tier foreign exchange market known by its acronym SFEM. But by then, an external debt overhang had developed and it strangled the economy for the next two decades. This lesson is worth repeating. A very short period of poor oil wealth management which benefited a handful of rich people had painful consequences for nearly all poor Nigerians, which persisted for a generation. Now, Nigeria isn't the only country to learn this lesson. Venezuela and many other oil exporting countries have learned the same lesson. Like Nigeria, they've learned it the hard way. Okay. So this is all very depressing. So, uh, so I'm going to tell you a more uplifting story. <laughs> so let me give you an example of a country that has managed this oil wealth well. This country adopted an oil price fiscal rule that not only insulated the non-oil traded goods sector against oil price volatility, but also helped to build a cushion of foreign exchange reserves, a big cushion of foreign exchange reserves. It managed its oil wealth with an eye to the future to helping not just the current generation, but also future ones. So I'm sure that all of you are thinking, especially the Nordics here are thinking, uh, he's talking about Norway, which is often held up and correctly so as best practice. Actually, I'm referring to Nigeria between the years 2003 and 2007. During those four years, Nigeria implemented fiscal and exchange rate reforms. It introduced unprecedented transparency into the recording and allocation of oil revenues. It renegotiated its Paris Club debt, which had created this debt overhang that was choking the economy. And the payoff was immense and immediate. For the first time in its history, Nigeria notched a BB minus sovereign credit rating it started to attract FDI, and everyone, not just in Nigeria, everyone started to talk of Africa rising. Mm. Nigeria rising is Africa rising. We know this from the past. It will be true. It will be true in the present, and it will be true in the future. Mm. Actually, not long before that, Norway had taken a course very similar to Nigeria's. Norway was quick to learn from its policy mistakes during the 1970s when fiscal policy was pro-cyclical, just as it was in Nigeria. The governor of Norway's central bank actually noted in a 2015 speech, he said, we learned from our mistakes. The oil, fund, the oil fund mechanism in 1990 and the fiscal rule in 2001 were introduced to discipline fiscal policy in such a way 
that Norway's petroleum wealth would also benefit future generations. So the main difference between Nigeria and Norway is not that they didn't put in place good policies, one did and the other one didn't. The main difference is that, is that Norway has stayed the course for much longer. Now, it's true that there are also other big differences between Nigeria and Norway. Nigeria's population is much bigger compared to its oil wealth. Its demographics also quite different, in many ways much better. Uh, and, but its economic governance institutions are less credible and they need to become much more credible. But the basic principles the Nigerian reform are the same. And they are, one, learn from your policy mistakes. Two, let markets determine the exchange rate. Three, keep public debt sustainable. Four, adopt oil price-based fiscal rules. Five, make accounting and allocation of oil revenues fully, completely, painfully transparent. Six, six devise a public investment program that promotes the diversification of the economy. Seven, above all, and this is the difference between the Norwegian experience and the Nigerian experience, stay the course. Stay the course. It might take a decade to, re to reap the dividends, but if you stay the course, you will surely reap the rewards. Surely, as surely as night follows day. Now, that ends my history lesson. Uh, Let's talk about today. So today, Nigeria is once again at the crossroads. It has begun to implement a far-reaching, politically difficult reform with national, regional, and even global repercussions. Without solid progress in Nigeria, the sustainable development goals that we all talk about will remain out of reach. Nigeria, after all, is now the country with the largest number of people living in extreme poverty, not just in Africa, but across the world. So in the 1990s, by the way, India took this position of the number one poor country from China. But a few years ago, Nigeria has taken that position as the number one poor country in the world from India. But the difference, of course, is that India and China have more than 1.4 billion people each. Nigeria's population is just about 225 million. That's about the same population as just two of China's largest provinces and just a bit more than India's largest state. A great, a great nation like Nigeria should not let this continue. I heard the song that Nigeria will survive. Of course, Nigeria will. It's a great nation. But great nations also thrive. And I hope that Nigeria will thrive and soon. To start that process of thriving, the president's signature reforms are essential. They are essential to break from the past and to chart a more hopeful course for all Nigerians. These include the unification of what used to be multiple exchange rates. They include allowing that unified exchange rate to be determined by the market. And of course, they include the elimination of fuel subsidies. So let me take, briefly take each one of these up in turn to show you how much oil wealth was being squandered in the past, the very recent past. So last year, before the reforms, the official exchange rate was roughly 465 Naira per dollar. The freely determined parallel rate at that time was closer to 700, meaning that for every dollar allocated at the official rate, the loss to the government was close to 250 Naira, every dollar. So the total loss in foregone federation revenues from oil, customs, and taxes on imports amounted to 6.2 trillion Naira in 2022. This was more than 3% of GDP. You can do a lot with 3% of $300 billion. Now, the cost of subsidizing PMS and keeping its price below market levels amounted to 4.5 trillion in the Naira in 2022. 
That was another 2% of GDP. You can do a lot with 2% of GDP, 2% of $300 billion. Together, these two subsidies, the implicit one from the exchange rate and the explicit PMS subsidies amounted to a staggering 10 trillion Naira a year by 2022 of $15 billion at the free market exchange rate. You can do a lot with $15 billion. Now, by the way, these were just the, these were just the direct fiscal costs. The wider costs may have been even greater. They included a huge implicit tax amounting to some 35% on oil exports, including manufacturing and agriculture. And ways and means advances became the primary way of financing the government to offset the cost of exchange rate and PMS subsidies. This meant inflation, of course. And as a result, debt service consumed all revenues by 2022, and the public debt was burgeoning. Nigeria was on the brink of a full-blown fiscal crisis and collapse in the confidence of the Naira. People talk about the options that Nigeria had at that time, the options that the president had at that time. He did not have that many options. Okay. But implementing such a far reform, such a far reaching reform is impossible without solid political commitment from the top. The price of PMS has quintupled since the subsidy cuts, imposing terrible hardship across the breadth of Nigerian society. The central bank has had to hike its policy rate by a huge 850 basis points. That's almost nine percentage points in the last nine months to boost confidence in the Naira and anchor inflationary expectations. But the central bank financing of fiscal deficits has finally ended. And Governor Cardoso has been putting Nigeria or be helping to put Nigeria on the right course, on the correct course. But this is only the beginning. Nigeria will need to stay the course for at least another 10 to 15 years to transform its economy. So I don't know if you're agreeing with me or if you're disagreeing with me. If it does that, if it does that, it will transform its economy and it will become an engine of growth in sub-Saharan Africa and it will help to transform sub-Saharan Africa. It's very difficult to do these things, but the rewards are massive. So this is the lesson from the last 40 years, as well as the experience of countries such as India, such as Poland, such as Korea, such as Norway. Okay. So again, I'm going to say something unpopular perhaps, but Nigeria's reforms from 2003 to 2007 were exactly what was needed, but they were not sustained. Today's fiscal monetary and exchange rate reforms are hurting everyone especially ordinary Nigerians who are struggling with the high prices of food and transport. The government must do everything in its power to protect the most vulnerable citizens against hardships because their lives and the lives of Nigeria's 110 million children depend on it. And it must stay the course or it must stay the course on reform because Nigeria's long-term future and the future of these 110 billion children, 110, 110 million children depends on it. Now, during the coming year, and I'm almost at the end, during the coming year, Nigerian policymakers have to do three things. The first is to prioritize non-oil growth. This requires a competitive exchange rate, which Nigeria now has. The Naira's real exchange rate is at its most competitive in at least 20 years. This is a great opportunity for the private sector. To protect the poor and maintain competitiveness, the central bank must stay focused 
on inflation. It should resist the lure of short-term capital inflows that might push up the Naira's value too quickly and crimp non-oil growth. It should rebuild foreign exchange reserves instead as a cushion against oil price volatility. Again, I think, I think Governor Cardoso is doing many of these things and he should be encouraged. The second, help every vulnerable household cope with still high inflation. The government is rolling out a large scale targeted temporary cash transfer program that has already reached between four and five million households. It should, quick, it should quickly extend this to 10 million households and perhaps more if necessary. Over the next few years, it should also install a cost-effective safety net to protect its most vulnerable citizens, financing it with some of the savings from the ending of fuel subsidies and exchange rate distortions. The third, it has to make the economy more business ready. And I think that the chairman of NESG actually put out a very clear agenda of what needs to be done there. I'll just summarize. Nigeria's need for jobs is immense. In the next 10 years, more than 12 million young Nigerians, both men and women, will enter the workforce. Generating jobs for them will greatly be will greatly be facilitated by the will only be actually only be facilitated by the private sector, and it will be facilitated by large-scale domestic and foreign and private investment in the non-oil sector. Attracting such investment means boosting the national power grid, improving transportation, improving security, and improving the rules and regulations and their enforcement for private enterprise. Now, <clears throat> so failure would set back reform efforts across the continent, besides ruining the future of yet another generation. Nigeria's elites show we are all elites here in this room, must unite to support these reforms to in enabling a broadly prosperous and stable Nigeria, they will be making perhaps the most valuable and the biggest bequest to their own children and grandchildren. Now, the World Bank team in Nigeria is one of the best we have. Okay. You have here an excellent country director in Javed Yop. You have a top-notch team of economists, of energy specialists, of operations staff. They have the expertise that is needed. Most importantly, though, especially in difficult times, they have the experience that the moment demands. Many of these experts that you have here in the Abuja office are people who are, who are veterans of similar reforms in places like Indonesia and many other places. Okay? You should take advantage of them. You should take full advantage of them. But the one thing that struck me about our team here, right, as I prepared for this, uh, so as I prepared for this, uh, uh, as I prepared for this visit, the most important thing that I learned about them is that they have great affection and admiration for everyday Nigerians. The Nigerian government and the people can count on their support 24 seven. And this team will get all the support they ask for from the entire World Bank group. I could not give you a stronger commitment. Thank you very much for listening. institutions and climate change it is so wonderful to welcome you to nigeria and to be part of what we are doing can we appreciate him one more time wonderful to welcome you to nigeria and to be part of what we are doing can we appreciate him one more time very quickly let me announce that if there are people still
Just tell the man you want to give your card to, to just take the photograph. All the details will be on your phone so that you can save your card for another event. And so your excellency is distinguished, ladies and gentlemen. His excellency, the vice president, is representing the president here. But the beauty of it is that he's also representing the president in Nigeria. And so the wahala of 220 million Nigerians on his shoulders. That is why we're going to be adjusting our program a bit and putting on hold for some for a few minutes the panel discussion. Um, His Excellency will address us uh, once we take photographs and he steps out. All of us will remain seated to take that panel. Uh, and so, with your permission, Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome here His Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria. His Excellency, Senator Kashim Shatima, GCON. Please kindly sit down, please. Chairman, my colleagues in the Federal Executive Council, who are visibly present here, the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Senator Atiku Bagudu, and the Minister of Steel Development, Prince Shuaib Abubakar Audu, the Chairman of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, my friend, a very erudite gentleman, Ni Yusuf. Directors of the NESG, captains of industry, members of the advisory board of the NESG, the organizing committee headed by my very good friend, Boye Olusanya, heads of the diplomatic missions and international organizations president, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Senior Vice President, World Bank Group, Mr. Christopher Stephens. Thank you for a beautiful speech, sir. The Vice President, African Development Bank, heads of government agencies and parastatals, captains of industry, honored guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is with immense pleasure that I address the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Over the past three decades, this summit has been a forum for government and private sector stakeholders to exchange ideas, debate policy, and identify innovative solutions to Nigeria's social economic challenges. The theme of this year's summit, collaborative action for growth, competitiveness and stability, could not be more appropriate as it encapsulates the pressing need for concerted efforts to address the multidimensional issues we currently face. Like many other nations, Nigeria has experienced significant economic turbulence over the past few years. The challenges have been global as well as domestic, ranging from the COVID-19 pandemic and fluctuation oil prices to internal security issues inflation and structural weaknesses in our economy, such as over-reliance on oil revenue and lack of economic diversification. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Nigeria's growth trajectory has been volatile, heavily dependent on oil revenues and unable to create enough jobs to keep pace with our rapidly growing population. As a nation, we must prioritize economic diversification. Your role in this process is crucial. Considering this, the present administration through the Renewed Hope Agenda has embarked on bold and courageous reforms designed to create an environment that fosters sustainable economic growth and shared prosperity. Our focus is on sectors that can offer inclusive and sustainable growth such as agriculture, 
manufacturing, and the digital economy. The digital economy holds a very promising prospect for revitalizing our economy. According to Con Perry, a global finance consultancy outfit, there will be 65 million global talent deficits by 2035. The United States, Brazil, and Russia will suffer from 6 million talent deficits each. The global talent powerhouse, India, by 2035 will only have 1 million surplus. And there are more English speakers in Nigeria than in India. And in terms of age, the average age of the Nigerian nation is 16.9. I believe, apparently, like all of us here, that wherever Nigeria goes, that's where Africa goes. I'm an eternal optimist, but I'm also a realist. We need to harness our potentials so that we can transform our anticipated demographic bulge into demographic dividends, not the demographic disaster that will consume all of us. As rightly said by my friend from the World Bank, some of the policy decisions, the policy options available are painful. But they are, were almost inevitable. My heart and the heart of President Bola Amatinebu goes to the Nigerian people. We emphasize with what the poor and the young are going through in the Nigerian nation. But we had no option, as he rightly said. Yes, some of these decisions are unpopular, but the truth that sets men free, as HS Aga said, is most often the truth that men prepare not to hear. But what he said were very poignant and were very, very truthful. We have thus prioritized investment in critical infrastructure, enhance our social safety needs, and promote innovation across all sectors. I am pleased to report that we are making significant strides in our safety needs and promote innovation across all sectors. I'm pleased to report that we are making significant strides in addressing several key issues. ability to overcome those challenges. Our objective is to ensure that the Nigerian economy is inclusive, where small and medium-sized enterprises can thrive alongside large corporations, and why every citizen, regardless of location or background, can benefit from economic opportunities. We have initiated various programs such as the MSME hubs and single digit loans for manufacturers designed to provide entrepreneurs with the support they need to succeed. We have also introduced the credit corporation to offer our workers consumer loans with single digit interest. These initiatives collectively will boost the economy and ensure it remains competitive in Africa and globally. Economic growth and competitiveness can only be sustained with political and economic stability. Since 2009, Nigeria has faced numerous threats to stability, from security challenges to macroeconomic, macro fiscal imbalances. The present administration is fully committed to confronting these issues head on. We are investing heavily in security operations to combat terrorism, banditry, and other forms of insecurity that threatens lives and livelihoods. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we're also implementing fiscal reforms to stabilize the macroeconomic environment, removing fuel subsidies, unification of exchange rates, and debt management strategies are all part of a broader effort to restore economic balance and ensure long-term stability. It is also important to note that stability is not just about managing crises as they arise. It is about building a resilient economy that can withstand shocks, ensuring the stability of the macroeconomic indicators and sustained growth trajectory. To achieve this, we must strengthen our social safety nets and ensure that the most vulnerable members of society are protected during tough times. 
We are already expanding programs like the National Social Investment Program, National Poverty Reduction with Growth Strategy, and other livelihood support initiatives crucial to millions of Nigerians. However, we must do more to institutionalize these safety nets and make them a permanent future of our economic architecture. No single sector or stakeholder can address these challenges alone. What we need now, more than ever, is collaboration. While the public and private sectors, civil society and international development pa partners collaborate to drive a shared vision for growth and development. I want to emphasize that the, challenge, that the challenges before us, while significant, are manageable and can be overcome with the right policies, the right partnerships, and the right level of commitment. Nigeria can emerge stronger, more competitive, and more resilient. The Nigerian Economic Summit remains invaluable for fostering the dialogue and collaboration needed to move our country forward. Let us use this platform to discuss and make actionable recommendations that will inform policy to drive growth, enhance competitiveness, and secure long-term stability for Nigeria. I beseech thee, I implore on all of us here, I would like to impress on every Nigerian in this gathering. The challenges before us are not insurmountable, but together, together, we shall overcome these challenges. The trajectory of global growth is facing Africa. Nigeria will make or mar that transition. Africa miss the agricultural age. We miss the industrial age. We are now in the knowledge-driven port industrial revolution. We cannot afford to miss this thing. We have the talents. We have the population. Of the eight unicorns in Africa, five are in Nigeria. Plutaweb, Interswitch, Paystack, and the gel. These are the drivers of change. We should spread hope. We should be having just of hope. Not of pessimism, not of delusion. Other nations are equally facing similar challenges, but they were able to overcome. We have to fuse into one, irrespective of our differences in political affiliations religious persuasions, tribal or sectional background. Weaponizing our economic challenges does not help anybody. Because whatever others from outside the world will pick about Nigeria is the narrative at home. When our own people are running down our nation, what impact will it make on the global community? I stand to be corrected. But more people are killed every day on the streets of America than in Nigeria. But do they emphasize those losses? Go and get the statistics for the city of Chicago on a weekend, and then we can compare notes. On this note, on behalf of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, I am honored to declare the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit open. I wish you for a full deliberation. Thank you for your attention and may God bless the federal report.